Okay, thank you, Yolanda. So I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the, the platform, uh, a hardware platform, uh, for a few minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dexter, who's going to tell you about the reference designs. And I should click the next slide. Okay, so this is the Spiral 2 Endo, uh, and you can see the, the industrial design of it here. Um, so the endoskeleton has a spine that goes down the, down the middle and has ribs. Uh, now it's an endoskeleton. Uh, we, we had also, uh, early in the project, considered uh, exoskeleton designs where all the modules would go into a box. Um, but we, uh, we didn't like those designs because we want to celebrate the modularity. We want the user to feel the modules. We want to give the module developers access to real estate on the outside of the phone and to allow the user to really make their own phone. Uh, rather than rather than 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 just customizing it, uh, so you can see. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about the endo and what the endo does and how it how it works. Uh, but the purpose of the endo, right, is to unify all the modules together and make them into a to a single device. And that function is decomposed into a couple of requirements. Uh, so one is module retention, right? The endo needs to securely hold the modules in place, which is something that it does with the the ribs uh, that form the slots. Uh, and also something that it does with electro-permanent magnets, uh, which are uh, a technology that I'll tell you a lot more about in a minute. Uh, the Endo provides mechanical strength to the whole phone, so it uh, protects uh, the phone from being bent too much and cracking the display. Uh, and the spine is actually a very important uh, feature for, uh, you know, because it's displaced from the neutral plane, right? It provides a lot of uh, mechanical stiffness uh, to, the, to the whole phone. Uh, the Endo uh, implements the data switch for the on-device network. And so there's a 14-port uh, uh, MIPI Unipro data switch uh, inside the phone uh, that, uh, that can uh, switch data, packet switch data at 10 gigabits per second from each of the uh, interface blocks, uh, allowing modules to communicate with each other. Uh, the Endo contains the uh, uh, RF bus, which allows uh, a radio in one module to uh, send and receive uh, data using an antenna in another module. And so it has analog switching uh, components inside to allow it to do that. Uh, and finally, the Endo uh, has the power bus, and the Endo has the power management processor, the SVC, uh, that, uh, that allocates power uh, and network bandwidth to, to the different modules uh, and, uh, and uh, manages the power bus. So I'm going to talk about each of those functions of the Endo uh, in, in, in sequence in a little bit more detail. Uh, and sort of by way of doing that, introduce you to, to the connection requirements for a module uh, to, to, uh, to be in the platform. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about the magnets, the EPM. So EPM stands for Electro-Permanent Magnets. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is an exciting technology. So this is a technology that it's kind of a cross between a permanent magnet and an electromagnet. So a short pulse of current can turn on an EPM or turn off an EPM but then it doesn't require any power to stay in either the on state or the off state. Uh, and so this is a schematic here that just shows how that, how that works physically. Uh, so the orange material is neodymium iron boron, which is a very, uh, very strong magnet. Uh, and you can see in the left and the right side, in the on and the off state, uh, the magnetic field points the same direction. Uh, it's not changed by the, by the pulse from the coil. The blue material is Alnico, Alnico is a material uh, which has its uh, field, its magnetic field can be much more easily changed by an external influence. Uh, and so a short pulse through the coil changes the direction of the magnetic field through the Alnico. And you can see in the left picture where the magnet's on, the arrow is, is pointing uh, to the left, but then in the right picture, the arrow is pointing to the right. So the pulse changes the direction through the Alnico and makes the magnetic field either stay entirely inside the device when it's off or go out into the module when it's on. So how have we implemented this in, in the system? Well, in Spiral 1, we had the EPMs in the modules. These are the, you can see the Spiral 1 EPMs there. And we got feedback from developers that, you know, this is very inconvenient to have to have these, you know, unobtainium EPMs in our modules and, uh, uh, and have a, a driver circuit for them and parse commands for them. And so in Spiral 2, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, made a change, and the EPMs are in the endo now. And you can, see, uh, you can see a photo there of the Spiral 2, uh, of the spiral two Endo with uh, uh, the EPMs, uh, uh, with the arrow pointing to them there. And you can see uh, a magnetic diagram there showing how the EPM in the Endo works uh, and how the magnetic field comes out from the spine, goes through a hyperco insert. Hyperco is a very, uh, 
very, uh, uh, a material that can take a very large amount of magnetic flux, uh, so it can be attracted very strongly to a magnet. Uh, and so a hyperco insert in the module allows it to attract, uh, attract to the endo. Uh, so here are some test results from the uh, Spiral 2 EPMs. Uh, these tests were done by our partner Foxconn. And you can see, you can see the test setup uh, there in the middle. Uh, and you can see the results plotted here. So this is showing the strength of the EPM uh, as a function of, as a function of uh, displacement away from the spine. Uh, and uh, the, you can see that at large distances, the, uh, the force is, uh, is as predicted. At short distances, it's not. We're working on refining both the test setup and the design of the EPMs to, to try to resolve that discrepancy. Um, but you can clearly see here that there is a, uh, you know, there is a difference in the force and the attach and the release state. Now, the attach force is not what we'd like it to be. It's not, it's not meeting the specification of the MDK yet. And uh, you know, we're working hard to, to improve it. Uh, this is a slide that shows the front module attach mechanism. Uh, so in the front, there's no spine. And so, so the uh, EPM mechanism used in the back, which is totally uh, uh, without moving parts, depends on the spine. And so we use an, a different method for module attach in the front. Uh, and so you can see here there's, uh, there's a, a, a slot in the, in the endo that has an EPM in it. And then there is a little springed piece. You can see the blue piece there is a, is a spring, a leaf spring, inside the module. And that little piece of, uh, of, uh, of uh, magnetic material gets pulled down into the endo uh, to firmly latch the module. Another reason we did this is because it's much more important for the front modules to be very firmly attached because, again, there's no spine. So when you hold the phone in your hand, they can slide back and forth if they're not firmly attached. And so we've, we've done this. Um, OK, I'm going to tell you about how the connectors work. So in Spiral 2, uh, we're using spring pins. And you can see a, a picture of the uh, customized spring connector in the lower left there. Uh, that provides uh, uh, a variety of electrical connection to the module. And then on the top, there's a module side PCB we call the interface block, uh, which is a uh, uh, small PCB in the module that is the connector uh, on the module side. Uh, and this uh, leads to, you can see the module there. Uh, uh, you know, so it has the a sort of smooth pebble industrial design that the industrial designers, uh, you know, ask for. It doesn't have any protrusions coming out for it or anything, anything to uh, snag when it's in your pocket, that kind of thing. I'll press again. Okay, so here's the pinout of the interface block. Uh, so now we're going to get into the, the nitty-gritty of this. There's, uh, there's eight pins that uh, provide MFI connection, MIPI MFI uh, version 3.0. Uh, and there's, uh, there's four other pins. So there's two pins for power and ground for the DC bus to connect to the module. There's, uh, there's an RF pin, which connects the module to the RF bus. Uh, and there's a wake detect pin, uh, which I'll talk more about in a minute, which is used for power management. Uh, we're using MIPI MFI uh, in Spiral 2 and onward. Uh, MIPI MFI uh, is a, uh, a new uh, PHI from the MIPI Alliance uh, that we've adopted. And the thing that attracted us to it and that makes us so excited about it is that it allows the very same set of pins to be used at a low speed and a low power or at a high speed and a high power. So it scales all the way from 2.4 megabits uh, and you know, milliwatt at the low end all the way up to uh, 10 gigabits uh, at the high end, uh, where in the configuration we're using it with two lanes. Uh, it allows for very fast, uh, you know, mi microsecond timescale switching between those modes. Uh, and so, uh, so we're using MIPI M5. Uh, electrical connectors are one of the most uh, unreliable parts of, uh, of any, any electronic system. Uh, and that unreliability goes up the more connectors there are and the more uh, use the connectors get. Uh, and so uh, something that we're working on for the Spiral 3 prototype is the contactless data interface uh, where we use inductive pads to communicate between the modules. Uh, you can see here sort of physically how that, how that works. Uh, there's a, a, the connector is replaced by traces on a printed circuit board, uh, and the data is transmitted by magnetic fields uh, that in the airspace between those. Uh, now, uh, because these are real wires and because they have resistance, uh, this transformer is a high-pass filter. 
And so the DC component of the signal does not get through. You can see on the lower right there, there's a pulse diagram showing, uh, you know, trying to send a pulse through the, through the inductive pad, but it gets high pass filtered into a set of two impulses, one on the rising edge, one on the falling edge. Uh, and uh, that, that would be very bad, except that we've put a hysteresis amplifier uh, onto the receiver. And the amplifier with hysteresis, uh, you can see there's a dashed line uh, at the uh, upper hysteresis threshold and a dashed line at the lower hysteresis threshold in the figure. And the signal has to rise above that dashed line to be considered a one and has to fall below that dashed line to be considered a zero. And so by that mechanism, the uh, data is recovered uh, and we're able, to, uh, we're able to, uh, to see the ones and zeros again. Uh, and so we've done some bench testing uh, of, uh, of, of these systems uh, in the lab. And so you can see in the upper left there, there's an endo uh, frame uh, and a module. Uh, and uh, this is a setup that we used in our lab to send Unipro uh, 800 megabits per second uh, through, through contactless data interface. Uh, and then you can see in the lower left some inductive loops uh, being sort of individually tested uh, with uh, RF connectors going to them. Uh, and in the middle of the slide, you can see the uh, S parameters. So this is uh, a plot of uh, data, uh, level of power transmission uh, versus frequency uh, through these pads. Uh, and that plot goes from 0 to 10 gigahertz on the x-axis, uh, which is the range needed for, for MIPI MPHI. Uh, and the, the, blue plot, the blue line there shows the amount of signal transmission. So very low at low frequencies, because it is a high-pass filter, but then plenty high uh, to send the signal uh, at, the, at the frequencies of interest for, for MPHI uh, once there's the hysteresis amplifier. So on this slide, we're showing some results from our uh, uh, partner Toshiba's IC development efforts. Uh, so we actually received in our lab uh, a week ago a package from Toshiba containing um, bridge and switch, Unipro bridge and switch ASICs containing the contactless media converter with the hysteresis amplifiers. And you know, we're eagerly, uh, eagerly testing them now uh, to, to, to see if they work. Uh, but this uh, slide shows some, uh, some spice model uh, simulations uh, of the actual uh, silicon on the, uh, the actual transistors on the chips. Uh, and you can see with the whole system put together, uh, there's, a, there's an eye with a 0.8 unit interval eye opening. Uh, so, so we're, you know, uh, diligently working to confirm this in the lab right now. So uh, stay tuned. So assuming all of this works, uh, the Spiral 3 industrial design, uh, we're thinking will probably look something like this. Of course, we're looking to solicit input from everyone here uh, through the course of this developer conference to, to, uh, to help us with this. Uh, but our, our vision right now is that we would have these interface blocks uh, with, uh, with uh, contactless connectors uh, for the data and then have uh, pins uh, coming out of the spine uh, for the power, uh, ground, uh, RF bus, and uh, wake detect. Uh, okay, so let me tell you about wake detect and what that is. Uh, but first, let me tell you about the RF bus. <laughs> so the RF bus uh, is, uh, is, is uh, to support diversity antennas uh, and to support better RF performance uh, in the phone. Uh, so if we're going to support 4G LTE, right, we need to be able to have MIMO diversity. Uh, and so in preparation for this, in Spiral 2, we're experimenting with an RF bus. And so this allows a uh, radio module, uh, a radio in one module, uh, to connect to an antenna in another module. And this is done through a 50-ohm uh, transmission line network through the, through the phone uh, and an analog switch matrix that allows uh, a module to con uh, antenna in one module to connect to a radio in another module. OK. Uh, power management is very important uh, for, uh, for a mobile device. Uh, there's all kinds of amazingly clever things that happen in integrated smartphones to, uh, to, to, to control and conserve the flow of power. Uh, and we need to uh, uh, do that in a modular way uh, in Project ARA. Uh, and so one uh, sort of important part of the platform for facilitating that is the wake detect signal. Uh, so this is a mechanism for the endo to detect if a module is present. For a module, like a battery module that has its own power, to detect if an endo is present. Uh, and for a, the endo to wake up a module from a very deep microamp sleep state. And for a module to wake up the endo from a very deep microamp sleep state. Uh, this is accomplished with a three-level signaling. Uh, so there's uh, at, at 0.9 volts, if this pin is at 0.9 volts, that means to both sides that 
a module is present and an endo is present, and that's sort of the normal state. Uh, the module can pull that signal down to zero volts to, uh, to, wake, up, to wake up the endo, uh, and the endo can pull that signal up to 1.8 volts to wake up the module. And this system, being DC coupled through one of the precious four pins, uh, allows the, uh, the inductive communication links to be turned off uh, when the phone is off or when the phone is in standby mode in your pocket and only be turned on uh, when, when you're actually using the phone. Okay, uh, the Project R platform has a very flexible uh, power bus that allows any module or any combination of modules to consume power, to store power, uh, and to provide power, and modules can do a combination of those things uh, also. There can be multiple batteries, uh, multiple chargers, battery hot swap, all that. Um, this is a block diagram showing how that's accomplished. So the endoskeleton has a DC power bus. Uh, the voltage floats from 4.8 volts at the high end down to 3.3 volts at the low end. Uh, the endoskeleton provides power protection uh, from over voltage and over current conditions. Uh, the SVC can allocate power. The SVC can turn off a module if it's using more power than it's allowed, uh, and so forth. Um, power storage modules and power providing modules contain an ideal diode. An ideal diode is an uh, electrical component that, uh, using a transistor, emulates a real diode, uh, but, but with no diode drop. Uh, it's very efficient. Uh, and the ideal diodes are in place so that uh, one power source does not backfeed another power source. So you can have multiple batteries and one does not inadvertently charge another or you do not inadvertently put power into the USB charger and so forth. Um, the times that batteries are charged or not charging uh, are controlled by switches in the, in the power storage modules. Um, and uh, uh, that's how the power bus works. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dexter from Quanta Computer, who's going to tell you about the Spiral 2 prototype and the reference modules. Here you go, Dexter. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Spiral 2 implementation and uh, the goal behind it. So uh, as you can look uh, on the slide, so there will be 10 modules and one endo uh, for the Spiral 2 reference design. If you look uh, from the front side, uh, there will be receiver modules and the LCD modules. From the back side, you can find on the pen side is there is a camera modules, connectivity modules, USB charger, fan fire antenna. And from the right hand side, you can see there's a 3G modem, uh, AP modules, battery, and speak modules. Well, as you may know, this is our reference design. So we prefer this kind of placement. But the era device do not require the user to put it that way. So uh, theoretically, the user can put any orientation and the location for each module as they want. However, some modules do have limitations and their preferred uh, location to fit in. For example, when user hold the phone, they don't want, with respect, they don't want to cover the antenna and uh, the camera lens will be covered by hand. That creates better user experiences. Uh, as extra, uh, for the camera. So I think there are no camera which is the square resolution. That means uh, typically the image will have a long side and a short side. And same applied to the LCD. If a user install the camera, which misaligns the long side and short side to the LCD, does that mean the camera will, will not work? No. Does that mean the picture will be in bad quality? No. But that really means uh, that probably uncertify and unsatisfy the users when if they want to see the preview image in the full screen. That's either maybe not visible or where with very strange spatial uh, uh, aspect ratio. Okay. So uh, although uh, we see those kind of problems, the ARA device still gives that option to the users uh, to decide what kind of the configuration is best today. Because we believe there are more and more cool modules is going to the market, which will eventually compete the best locations uh, of the slot. So uh, 
we take a different approach uh, to the traditional smartphone, which usually give you the user a predefined and very limited uh, choices. We give the ball and playground to the user to decide what's the best way to meet their uh, need in their own logic. So to us, I think that like the best uh, feature uh, which our projects can bring to the user. Okay, uh, let's go to the AB module. Um, actually, uh, we have a 10 modules and one window, but I actually took only three of them to illustrate what's the typical implementation and what's the problem we will really meet. Okay, so uh, this picture actually is come with the Mapeo processor. We have other processor uh, like NVIDIA uh, also working. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the, the block diagram, okay, you can see there's a Toshiba HS bridge. What does that mean? Uh, indeed, uh, Google has worked with Toshiba to create a three chipset, uh, ASIC for the Unipro bus. So there will be there are uh, Unipro switch, AP bridge, and GP bridge. Uh, what does that mean? Um, the Unipro switch is the central hub for Unipro bus, which routing the data and controls. The AP bridge uh, is the uh, data bridge between the application processor to either the Unipro switch or MIPI devices such as camera or display. The GP bridge implement the other interfaces such as the USB, SDIO, S2, 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 PCM, and so on and so forth. So since this is the AP module, we need to put the AP bridge into it. And uh, associated with this uh, Toshiba bridge, we need a flash on the left, left hand side. Uh, the purpose of light flash is to put the module specific firmware into it. So during boot, uh, the firmware will be loaded into the Toshiba bridge to configure the module uh, to talk to the editor. On the right hand side, you can see there's a uh, HS bridge regulators, which is a power unit uh, specifically required for like, the Toshiba bridge. And uh, also we have a uh, uh, wake up detect circuitry like uh, error mentioned, etc. In total, just like uh, Paul pointed out, there will be 30, uh, actually 25 to 30 percent overhead on the PCB. In the future, we believe uh, nowadays because most of ASIC do not come with native Unipro interface, that's why we need so many good, good logics and 25% uh, uh, penalty on the space. But in the future, if most of the ASIC come with the native Unipro uh, interface, the overhead should be something below 10 or so maybe only 5%. Um, another point is that you can see that there's a uni, uh, USB connector layer. The purpose for like, the USB connector is not for the end user, because when you port in the Android, you definitely need a debug port, Android debug port ADP. Uh, we are on the way to implement the ADP uh, through the uh, Unipro uh, bus, but right now it's not ready yet, so we strongly recommend that uh, you need to some ADP in the uh, AP modules so that you can spare your development. Okay, uh, this slide shows uh, another typical module, which is a one by two module. Uh, uh, this is a 3G module. Uh, we pick up uh, off the shelf standard modules from Gmento. And uh, as you can see, uh, the 3G module itself occupies most of the space of the one by two module already. So we have a very limited space for the good logic and extra. We need a, a SIM slot for it. So uh, in order to overcome this kind of limitation, uh, we use a PCB technology called Rigiflex, which means they combine the different layer of the PC and uh, uh, the FR4 together to, form, to uh, increase the utilization of uh, space efficiency. Okay, uh, the last one, but I think it's most important one is uh, a pollution sensor. Okay, uh, this pollution sensor implemented the PM 2.5, 
which means uh, uh, invisible dust uh, density sensor. Okay, we create these sensors uh, per Google's request for two purposes. First one, uh, if you check the MDK, they are a guideline for oversized modules. So you can develop a, size, a module which is oversized, but still compliant to the MDK uh, guidelines. This is it. Uh, second, I think uh, maybe most important, I will spend some time on it. Okay. Uh, you can see the portion sensors uh, has uh, sensors. Okay. And also it got a mini fan and also a negative ion generator. The purpose is to clean the dust attached to the chambers afterwards. Okay. It could be arbitrarily complicated, uh, you know, if you looking for the other sensors or other devices. Okay. Um, so it differs from the traditional smartphone peripheral approach. Uh, which usually use the USB, SDIO, and uh, even audio jack. Uh, the difference comes from that once you insert this module into the ARA slot, it becomes a native part of the ARA platform. As if this ARA device, this ARA device is designed specifically for these functions. So you can utilize the four bus uh, bandwidth. You can utilize the full power of the processor. And also, you can utilize all the facility equipped, uh, the, the ARA uh, device equipped, and create a lot, of, um, a lot more applications through the sensor fusion or by any other means. OK, so through this way, what means to the developer is that you can use the ARA device as a vehicle to create a non-trivial professional service and applications and launch to the end user, as if they have a dedicated devices for your application and services, which I think is the most uh, valuable part for the module makers. And uh, through this way, uh, we can create a very different, significant and the meaningful application to the end users. Yeah. So that's basically about it. Uh, finally, I think uh, we found that team are very uh, excited to join this team. And uh, hopefully, we, together with the other team members, and of course, you guys, we can, through this kind of vehicle, uh, we can create different significant and meaningful applications for the world. So let's conclude my presentation. Thank you.